We're thrilled to have this turnout here at the end of a semester, at the end of a long year for uh, many, many people in 2018. It's been a fantastic year here at the School of Public Health as we've been celebrating our 75th anniversary of the school, fetting many of our 15,000 alumni that we have who are out around the community, the state, the world, working to improve the health of the population for everybody, including our, our, our most vulnerable populations, and especially our, our most vulnerable populations. Before we introduce our speaker today, I just want to say a few thank yous uh, with regard to this 75th anniversary year. Uh, first of all, to uh, Priya Mehta and her team, Eve Cohen, Maury Herman, uh, who've been uh, just working flat out to make all of these events happen all year long, as well as Linda Anderberg and the communications team has put together a fantastic 75th anniversary edition of our school's magazine. It will be out very shortly of, uh, within the week. We will be distributing that, and it's, uh, it should be very exciting for you all to, to read and, about what the, the school has been up to more recently, as well as talking about our, our sort of longer history in the school. I also want to give a special shout out to our Dean Emeritus, Steph Bertozzi, who did so much to set up all of the events for, for this year and, and so much over the, the, the last uh, several years. If you've missed some of our 75th anniversary events, for example, the, the Van Jones uh, talk last month that is now available online. Uh, we are also recording the event today. So if people in, uh, in the future couldn't make it here, you can let them know that uh, we, we will make this available. Also, I just want to give a special sneak preview of an announcement that will be going out to the school community very shortly of our, uh, in terms of our upcoming events. At the commencement, our commencement speaker will be Bernard Tyson, the leader of uh, Kaiser Permanente, a nonprofit that's doing so much in, in the community to advance health, not just within the four walls, but out in the community as well. So we'll, we'll have a, a formal announcement of that coming up soon. But today, we are very pleased to host one of our most distinguished alumni of this school, Sir Michael Marmot. I've had the pleasure to work with Sir Michael on the MacArthur Network on Socioeconomic Status and Health for a number of years. And as you can imagine, he was a very inspiring part of uh, that network and pushing forward the, the work that we were able to do and was certainly a great education inspiration to me. And I'm not going to give the full uh, uh, introduction to Sir Michael today. I'm going to turn over the podium to one of our most esteemed uh, professors, Professor Emeritus Len Syme, who has had a longstanding relationship and mentorship with Sir Michael. Uh, so Len will talk more uh, about his many years of, of working with uh, Sir Michael. But as many of you know, Len is often considered the father of, of social epidemiology. He is a giant in the field. He's a, a giant in our school. And so I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Len to uh, come on up and introduce Sir Michael. And we'll have a, uh, a, the, the talk, and we'll have time for Q&A. So Len, please. Thank you all. Well, it is really a pleasure to welcome you all here on this special occasion. <clears throat> um, especially the 75th anniversary. This is really a remarkable time in the school. Michael came to Berkeley to get an MPH <clears throat> and PhD in 1972. It's interesting how he came here. I was giving a talk in 1971 in New Zealand. And at the end of the talk, a guy came up to me and said, you really do that stuff at Berkeley? I said, yeah. He said, you know, we've got a medical student at Sydney. He's the best student in the school, but he's driving us crazy. <laughs> Questions, complaining, questioning everything. Would you, if we, we don't give fellowships to students to study abroad because they don't rarely, they don't come back. But if we made an exception in his case, would you take him? <laughs> I said yes, and that was the beginning of, of, uh, of the story. So as you perhaps know, Michael is professor of epidemiology at the University College London. He's director of the Institute of Health Equity in the Department of Epi at the University College. He's written two very important books, The Health Gap and The Status Syndrome. 
he's been elected. The, the list of organizations that which he belongs is almost too long to go into, but I do need to mention a few. He chairs the Commission on Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas. He's been awarded honorary degrees from 18 universities, including the University Medical School in Sydney that urged him to travel abroad. <laughs> He's been awarded honorary degrees. In, in 2000, he was knighted by Her Majesty for his work in health inequalities. He's president of the British Lung Association, honorary fellow of the American College of Epidemiology, fellow of the American Academy of Medical Sciences, an honorary fellow of the British Academy, an honorary fellow of the Faculty of Public Health for the Royal, Royal College of Physicians. But to me, the most significant of all of those things is past president of the British Medical Association and president of the World Medical Association, bridging the gap between clinical medicine and public health. It's a remarkable phenomenon. Uh, but the thing that I learned this morning is, to me, the most interesting. Google Scholar lists a number of most cited scholars in the world. I can't remember who's number one, but number three is Freud, Sigmund Freud. Number 55 is Einstein. And Michael is number 59. <laughs> so the, uh, the alumnus we're talking about is probably the most famous public health person in the world. And it's a real honor to have you join us today. And it's an absolute pleasure to be back in Berkeley. And it's looking so splendid. Thank you. Social justice and health equity is the theme of what I do. Uh, I was asked by a member, a younger member of my extended family, is anyone listening to you? <laughs> I thought that youngster is going to have a bright future. He <laughs> knows how to ask the right question. And in a way, Will Dow asked, didn't quite ask it that way, but he said, what have you been doing since you left Berkeley? You know, would you come back and tell us? So I'm going to indulge myself a little bit uh, to try and answer my young relative's question, is anybody listening to you? So I published a book, The Health Gap. Thank you. And I said this is indulgent, um, translated into Japanese, into Korean, and into Italian, La Salute di Suguale. Only the Italians would have me on the cover like that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know where they got that from. And not only La Salute di Suguale, unequal health, the Trento in northern Italy, the Trento Festival of Economics, the year before last, had as their theme, La Salute Disuguale, Festival of Economics. And I was invited, and I'd quite forgotten that La Salute Disuguale was the theme. And I arrived in Trento, and there were all these big posters saying La Salute Disuguale. I thought, this is really odd. And then there was a cardboard cut out of me. <laughs> so I had to have a photo taken next to it. <laughs> and I sent it to my kids. And one of my sons came back and says, I think the cutout looks better than the original. <laughs> and forgive me for this next one, Len. Um, crossword of La Repubblica Italia magazine, 146 down. British physician, founder of social epidemiology. Now, I don't know, Marmot, I don't know where, I haven't got a category on my CV to put that one, but <laughs> it seems to me it does provide a partial answer to my young relative's question. Uh, I mean, Italian crossword puzzles. I very much doubt that anyone other than Luca de Fiore solved the puzzle that day. <laughs> it seems to me a bit unfair. Um, and I went through my diary for a few months at the 
people who'd asked me to come and talk to them about social determinants of health, internal medicine, cardiology, respiratory disease, mental illness, obstetrics, cancer, surgery, pediatrics, urban renewal, violence, inclusion in health, health psychology, primary care, pharmacy, psychosomatic, violence and crime, vegetables. <laughs> and then we we'll come and talk about vegetables. A group of classical scholars in the University of Edinburgh in Scotland asked me to talk about honour in the ancient world. I said, I once saw a film about Alexander the Great. What can I... They said, your message about leading a life of dignity we think is highly relevant. And so would I come and do the first of a set of public lectures? Oh, and um, public health. Um, <laughs> So people are, I think they're listening, at least they're asking me to come and put it into various domains. Some of you will have heard about the Whitehall studies of British civil servants, which is how I started doing this, because we observed a social gradient. And the gradient that we observed in Whitehall, we see in the country as a whole. This is life expectancy, each dot, is a neighborhood in England classified by degree of deprivation and affluence. So to the right, as you look at it, you've got the most affluent neighborhoods. And the top graph is life expectancy. And you can see that people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. People in the middle, shorter life expectancy than those near the top. The gradient runs all the way from top to bottom. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. The gradient is steeper. I hasten to add that I use life expectancy as an indicator. People often ask, well, you know, th there's more to life than just how many years you live. Of course, but it's an indicator of how well we're doing. And let me say it now, and I'll probably say it again, I think it's a very good indicator of how well we're doing as a society. And that's rather important because we've been monitoring since I produced, and I'll tell you about it in a few moments, since I produced my English review, the so-called Marmot Review, we've been monitoring health, health inequalities and social determinants of health every year, year and a half. Last year, we published these figures. Life expectancy at birth, that goes back to 1980. But in fact, I could go back to the end of the First World War. From between about 1921 and 2011, life expectancy increased about one year every four years. Wow, that's six hours every 24 hours. If you've been working for six hours today, you got that for nothing. <laughs> Your life expectancy at the end of that six hours is as long as it was at the beginning. That's terrific. That went on for 90 years. And in 2011, it ground to a halt for men and for women. The government was a bit sensitive about this. We had a new government elected in 2010. Couldn't be our fault, surely. Well, I spent a day, you know, the BBC and one thing and another, and our Secretary of State for Health, our health minister, tweeted, respect Marmot. He didn't have any punctuation. I didn't know if there was a question mark. <laughs> respect Marmot or respect Marmot? Anyway, respect Marmot. But since he was on the BBC this morning, life expectancy for men has increased by 61 minutes. <laughs> I scratched my head and I tweeted back, what are you saying, question <laughs> mark, that the Office for National Statistics got its sums wrong? If ONS got it right, let's discuss. A colleague of mine tweeted, ooh, Jeremy Hunt's picked a fight with Marmot. <laughs> My money's on Marmot. <laughs> it 
if I do a popular tweet and you know, it gets retweeted 25 times or something, this was tweeted 115,000 times. You know. so, this, so I wrote to the health secretary and I said, this is a health crisis. You need to take this as seriously as you would a winter bed crisis. And he did. He ignored them both, which wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> One question that I got asked was by the press was, maybe we've just reached, I'm looking like the Italian, aren't I? You know, <laughs> maybe we've just reached peak life expectancy. It's got to slow down sometime. Good question. So we looked across Europe. The pale green is 2006 to 2010, and the dark green the next five years. And this is women. And indeed, it did slow down in most European countries, which is consistent with the effect of the global financial crisis and policies of austerity put in place in the wake of the global financial crisis. But we're on the bottom. So we'd not reach peak life expectancy because other European countries with longer life expectancy than ours were still going up. And you can see why the government was sensitive because I was making the case that the health of the population tells us something fundamentally important about how well the needs of the members of that society are being met. and something's going wrong. I hasten to add, you won't believe it, but I am not party political, at least in public. So when I talk about the Labour government, I'm not trying to make a party political point. I'm just looking at the evidence. Can strategies to reduce health inequalities work? The new Labour government did have a strategy to reduce inequalities. Any evidence that it worked? Well, colleagues from Liverpool looked at the gap in life expectancy between the poorest 20% of local authorities, the bottom quintile, and everybody else. In the period before Labour's strategy, the gap between the poorest 20% and everybody else was increasing. Inequalities were getting bigger. Labour was elected in 1997. Some of us were involved in advising them and their strategy kicked in around 2003. Wow, the gap between the poorest 20% and everybody else got smaller. They were booted out of office. Conservative-led coalition government changed everything and the gap increased again inequalities are getting bigger. I did a statistic course once, and as a result, I know the correlation does not equal causation. That's a joke, by the way. Um, so it's not proof, but it's what you'd like to see if the policies were going to make a difference. It's consistent with the idea that having a nat national strategy to reduce health inequalities worse, it works, and ditching that strategy is bad. And I said, this is not where we want to go. I was sitting in Hong Kong a couple of weeks ago, and the BBC World Service called me and they said US life expectancy has just declined for a third year. The news had just come out. Would I talk to them? Well, I'd been showing this slide that life expectancy declined two years in a row. It's now three years in a row. And the big increase in unintentional injuries, 63,600 deaths. It includes drug overdose. The figures that were published whenever it was a week at and a half ago, 70,000 deaths due to drug overdose. If you add to that 30,000 deaths due to firearms, that's 100,000 deaths. It shouldn't occur. There's a lot about the US I don't understand. I, was, I once visited 
and two New York baseball teams were playing each other and they called it the World Series. I really don't, um, so it's a lot, but you're, someone can explain that to me afterwards. But guns kill 30,000 people. Why would you want to do that? Quite apart from drugs. So I said in the UK, this is, is this where we want to go? Is this where we want to end? My wife said to me recently, there are three very important democracies that have impacted on our lives, and two of them are in absolute crisis. The third is Australia, and they get rid of prime ministers every year or so, but that looks healthy compared with what's going on in the UK and the US at the moment. And one of the messages is that the mind is an important gateway by which social determinants affect ill health. Hence, all those drug-related deaths. It's psychosocial, but there are social determinants. The gradient in health, this is life expectancy by year of birth for men, as it, by year of birth, life expectancy at age 50, by deciles of income. There's the gradient in the US, the poorest 10%. People who were born in 1920 will be 50 in 1970. People who were born in 1950 will be 50 in 2000. And you can see that for the, the poorest 10%, life expectancy went up a little bit. The next 10%, it went up a bit more a bit more and more and more and more. So the inequalities got dramatically bigger. Life expectancy was improving for everyone, but the inequalities got much bigger. Now, some of you have not had lunch and you're probably feeling a bit delicate, fragile. Are you strong enough for me to show you the next slide? I think perhaps I should get informed consent before I, I show you the next slide. This is women. Exactly. <gasps> Life expectancy is falling for the bottom 10%. It's falling for the next 10%. It's falling for the third decile. The bottom 30% life expectancy at age 50 for women is getting worse. It's not just that the inequalities are increasing, but it's getting worse. This is a national tragedy. Well, it's to deal with these issues that I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We called our report, Closing the Gap in a Generation. We put on the cover, Social Injustice is Killing on a Grand Scale. Slightly unusual for a WHO report. And we said that key is empowerment, material, psychosocial and political. In the wake of the WHO report, I was invited by the British government to answer the question, how could we apply the findings and recommendations of your global commission to one country, England? And the so-called Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. We did a European review of social determinants and the health divide. And we're in the process of completing the commission of the Pan American Health Organization on equity and health inequalities in the Americas. We've called our report Just Societies, Health Equity and Dignified Lives. The executive summary is available. We're still writing the report, but we've got the summary. I'm now going to do the unpardonable and repeat something that I did here three years ago. And there are two possibilities. One, three of you remember. <laughs> and the other possibility is that nobody remembers. Uh, but I do it for a reason. When I published my book in 2015, um, I had drawn attention to the health gap in Baltimore. And I said that if you live in Roland Park, life expectancy for men, 83. 
and you want to see what it's like to live in an area with life expectancy 20 years shorter, you could get on a plane and fly to Ethiopia. Alternatively, you could go a few miles across town to Upton Druid. The reason I'm showing it now is before I came here in 2015 to talk about it, Baltimore erupted. And you'll remember that the precipitant of that civil unrest was the killing of a black man by the police. Or should I say, one more killing of a black man by the police. Now, when I say Baltimore erupted, it wasn't Baltimore, it was Upton Druid. And I won't go through all of it, but um, a typical young man growing up in Upton Druid, half a single parent families, median household income, $17,000, 90% did not go into college. Each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 were arrested for a juvenile disorder. A third of each year, each year, a criminal record by 17. In theory, the slate is wiped clean at 18. You're not supposed to ask. So if a young man is asked, have you ever been in trouble with the police? He could lie. That's not a very good qualification for getting a, well, actually, could get you to the White House, but, um, <laughs> uh, but for normal people, it's not a very good qualification. I told you I'm not party political, it just <laughs> slipped out. Um, or he could tell the truth, in which case it's not a very good qualification for getting a job. And 100 non-fatal shootings for every 10,000 residents and nearly 40 homicides. In Roland Park, Median income, not $17,000, but 90, 75% complete college, juvenile arrests, one in 50, not one in three, and no non-fatal shootings and four homicides, not 40. Crime maps on geographically to health. They're the same areas, which makes one think of the overlap in the causes of crime and the causes of being arrested and getting into the criminal justice system. I visited the Northern Territory of Australia this year. This is the thriving metropolis of Arayonga, 230 population, and there is no economic base whatsoever. The only way people could get any money is crime. What else is there to do? Parenthetically, I went to the health clinic in Arayonga and they're very proud, you know, prevention of diabetes. We tell people to eat healthily, fruit and veg. Fruit and vegetables, they have no money. There is a store. The price of an apple would be higher than in Alice Springs. And in Alice Springs, it's higher than in Sydney, and there's no economic base at all, and they're telling people to eat fruit and vegetables in the, in the Northern Territory, in the desert. And in Alice Springs, there's the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory. It looms like this terrible presence over Alice Springs. Usually it's the hospital that's the largest building, but this is the law court that is the largest building. And the incarceration rate for Indigenous Australians, 240 per 100,000. For non-Indigenous in Northern Territory, it's 186, a 13-fold difference. 84% of the prison population is Indigenous, compared with 27% of the general population. And 72% of the young men in prison have a diagnosed mental illness and 92% of the women. What a terrible place to put somebody with mental illness in prison. Can you imagine a worse place to put a damaged young person than in prison? Incarceration rates, Japan, 48 per 100,000. The UK, 
is 148 per 100,000, and the United States is 700 per 100,000. You have this penchant for locking people up. And it may not be altogether good. If you look at life expectancy in the bottom income quartile by state level incarceration rate, the bottom five incarceration rates and the top five incarceration rates, and life expectancy is better for the bottom income quartile in states that have lower rates of incarceration. It may well be that the mass incarceration is a social determinant of health in addition to all the other things. And in Denmark, they claim that violent offending, 10% of males and 26% of females have mental illness. In the UK, we think 80% of criminal activity is attributable to people who had conduct problems in childhood and adolescence. So whether it's 10% or it's 80%, it's a lot. Therefore, prevent mental illness in children. That's good for their health, and it's likely to be a way of keeping them out of prison. In my English review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. Fourth one, really radical, in a rich country, Everybody should have enough money to live on. I was in Australia recently, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment, and the chief executive of one of the health organizations said, tell me some more about minimum income for healthy living. And I said, well, I lecture to medical students at my university. Len doesn't believe I'm there long enough to lecture to medical students. But I lecture to first year medical students. I get them in their pre-cynical phase. And, uh, and I talk to them about minimum income for healthy living. And I say part of the calculation for an older person is having enough money to buy presents for their grandchildren. And this chief executive from this healthcare organization started to weep. And he said, choking up, recently my mother told me that my granddad used to go without meals to buy us birthday presents. That's part of leading a dignified life, having enough money to buy your children your grandchildren a present. And in a rich society, we ought to be able to organize our affairs so everybody could do that. Healthy and sustainable places to live and work and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. So I'm not gonna go through them all, much as I'd love to. If you'd like to stay till four o'clock, then I'll keep going. But in case you've got something else to do, I won't do it all. I told you I'm not party political, so blue and red have no significance. <laughs> but look, if you would, at the blue dots. Ignore the red dots for the moment. What we're plotting here is the percent of children who have a good level of development age five. For every local authority in England, by level of deprivation. So you see this straight line relation, the less deprived, the more affluent, the higher the proportion of children age five with a good level of development. One strategy for bringing everybody up and thereby reducing inequalities in early child development is to reduce deprivation bring the local authorities down here up towards the middle. But they scatter around the line. For a given level of deprivation, some local authorities are doing better than others. Now you're allowed to look at the red dots. The red dots are children eligible for free school meals. It's a means-tested benefit. So these are the poor kids. When I first saw these data, I hated it. 
I got it absolutely wrong. I predicted exactly the opposite. And I did what any scientist would do when you get data that conflict with your hypothesis. I tried to get rid of the data. <laughs> I mean, a good idea is hard to come by. You can always get more data. Um, I said, we must have coded it wrongly. We, we analyzed it wrong. Do it again. And it's still there. And one difference between science and politics is in science, when you're wrong, if you don't admit it, you just get swept off the stage because you know you become an irrelevant. So I was wrong. It didn't the poor kids are doing worse in the affluent areas? The more deprived the area, the better do the poor kids do. Hey, that's the opposite of what I predicted. It's really interesting. So I went to a poor area. So let's look at England first. 60% of children age five have a good level of development. The poor kids eligible for free school meals, just under 45%. The gap is just under 16%. Hackney in East London, a poor area, rapidly gentrifying, but a lot of poor kids there. Look at the poor kids. They do as well as the English average. The gap between the poor kids and the average is 4%. The director of education in Hackney said, we tell ourselves every day, poverty is not destiny. We can make a difference. And the evidence supports her. Bath and North East Somerset, I don't expect you to know the social geography of England, but beautiful Georgian Bath setting gorgeous green countryside. I was catching a train to South Wales and it stopped at Bath Spa and I called out, what do you do for poor kids in Bath? <laughs> and I'm not hearing voices, but I imagine them calling back, poor kids? We didn't know we had any. Aha. Uh -huh. Hey, this is better than rocket science. <laughs> Focusing on the problem, you can make a difference. The poor kids in Hackney are doing dramatically better than the poor kids in Bath. There's a London effect, and we see it in education. Being poor in London doesn't have the same impact on your educational performance as being poor in the rest of the country. Part of that is the spend per pupil is higher in London. The government said, that's unfair. We better equalize it and reduce the London spend. No, don't reduce the London spending. Increase it everywhere else. What better is there to do with money than spend it on education? We can solve this. This is not really very difficult. And what about reducing child poverty? Well, child poverty, less than 60% median income. In Denmark, 9%. Iceland, 10%. Norway, 10%. Finland, just under 11%. Korea. United Kingdom, just under 20%. United States, 29%, just below Mexico. I think the real pornography in the United States is not what that orange nightmare did with a porn star. It's the fact that no one's talking about child poverty. This is terrible. No wonder they laughed at the United Nations when he said this is the best our nation's ever been. 29% of kids growing up in poverty and that's going to have a dramatic impact for the rest of their lives. The other part of early childhood is not lack of the good things, but presence of the bad things, adverse child experiences, incarceration, drug abuse, and they all follow the social gradient. These are English data, but it would look similar in California where these studies were first done. And the effect of having four or more adverse child experiences, if you could get rid of four or more adverse child experiences, you'd 
reduce early sex by a third, unintended teen pregnancy by 38%, smoking by a sixth, binge drinking, cannabis. Look at violence perpetration. Half the perpetrators of domestic violence had four or more adverse child experiences. And even more chilling, half the victims of domestic violence had four or more adverse child experiences. Do something about the social inequalities and in adverse child experiences and you change the trajectories for the rest of that child's life. And this has got nothing to do with anything. Wealth inequality in OECD countries, this is the share of total wealth enjoyed by the top 1%. The average for OECD countries is just under 20%. There's Japan, 10%, Italy, and there coming out as a clear winner is the United States. 2010, 2014, or the latest, and their wealth inequality is going up dramatically. So there's no money to do anything about child poverty because these guys are pretty good at not paying taxes. And in fact, if they weren't good already, they've been helped by the legislature to pay less taxes. So how could you deal with child poverty when it's very important that the top 1% run away with all the money? Ensure a healthy standard of living. These are UK data. Our politicians say that people are poor because they're feckless. Uh, what was the US thing, welfare queens and the like? Because um, they're feckless. Of people who are below the minimum income threshold, a majority, more than half, were in families where at least one adult was working. People are poor, not because they're feckless, but because they're lowly paid. If you paid them more, they wouldn't be poor. Gosh, that's complicated. And tax havens. Tax havens increase inequality. 50% of wealth in tax havens belong to the top 0.01% of people in advanced economies. That wealth is equivalent to 5% of global GDP. That's tax avoidance on a massive scale. Added to that is avoidance of tax by multinationals. 600 billion euros a year shifted to the world's tax havens, 350 billion euros into European tax havens. I went to a meeting in Luxembourg and I kept looking around at everybody else thinking, who are you defrauding? They were probably looking at me the same way. Which country are you cheating out of taxes? The Starbucks was asked to come and give evidence to British Parliament. And the members of Parliament said, why don't you pay taxes in Britain? And Starbucks said, we don't make a profit. So kind of them. They're a charity. They're providing coffee to <laughs> British people out of the goodness of their hearts. How come you don't make profit? Well, we buy our coffee beans from the Netherlands. What? I go to the Netherlands quite often. I've never seen a coffee plant anywhere in the <laughs> Netherlands. They don't grow coffee beans in the Netherlands, they grow accountants. <laughs> they get their coffee beans from Costa Rica and from Brazil, where everybody else gets coffee beans from. But they make it look like they buy them from the Netherlands and it's very expensive to buy coffee beans from the Netherlands because they don't produce them there. So that way they don't pay taxes in Britain. It deprives the EU of a fifth of corporate taxes, 60 billion euros a year. For the UK, it's 12.7 billion euros. Now, this is very parochial. The biggest single lie that the Brexiteers perpetrated was we send 350 million pounds a week to the European Union. It was a lie. They were told by the statistics authority that it was a lie. They were told not to do it. They put it on the side of a big red bus. Our Trump, Boris Johnson, just perpetrated that lie and on and on and on. So just out of interest, 350 million pounds a week, 18.2 uh, billion, is the same order of magnitude as the tax avoidance by multinationals in Britain. We could pay for our national health service if we stop tax avoidance. I've got good news. 
So I've been giving you all this bad news. Um, cities are getting interested. The city of Coventry in England declared itself a Marmot city. <laughs> you probably don't know this, but the symbol, the logo of Coventry is Lady Godiva because uh, she lived in Coventry. You remember the story? She could, took a kit off and rode naked through the street. And I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> if it's a marmot city, have I got to take my kit off and get on a bicycle and go naked through? Um, but it's more exciting than that. And they're improving early child development. They're getting jobs for young people. They're doing all sorts of wonderful things. I was invited to Trieste. I was told it was an Italian marmot city. I don't know if the people of Trieste knew that, um, but it was really exciting what the civilized, humane people can do who are absolutely committed to improving things in their city. It's just terrific. And we've got this health equity network in the Americas following on from our PAHO Commission. Lots of good things happening. As Len mentioned, I spent a year as president of the World Medical Association. And I pursued the hypothesis that I could get doctors interested in health. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I like to set challenges. Um, and not only that, that I could get them interest in the social determinants of health. I reminded them that the first line of my book was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. We need to deal with the conditions that make people sick. And my two messages in a world of post-fact politics was evidence-based policy presented in a spirit of social justice. I reminded them that we said on the report, the cover of the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. I mentioned that we did this commission in the Americas, we're doing it, and we had a meeting in Washington, D.C., and I went for a walk in the mall. Uh, it was during Trump's inauguration, but there weren't many people there, so it was, <laughs> it was okay. Um, <laughs> oops. Um, and I found myself in the section devoted to Martin Luther King. And... Dr. King said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love, and I thought, unarmed truth. Evidence-based policy is a slightly more prosaic way of saying that. And unconditional love, well, ever, you know, spirit of social justice. King said it better, but then he's one of the great orators of all time. But I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. We're living in dark times in the UK and the United States. But with Dr. King, we have to believe that we will triumph over evil. It's winning only temporarily. Let me tell you some more good news in the face of bad news. One of the advantages of being president of the World Medical Association, I'm clutching at straws here, um, was that I now have colleagues in lots of countries. And I was invited by the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission, to do a series of radio lectures in Australia. And the Australian Medical Association wrote to me and said, can we help you while you're here? I said, yeah, I would like to see examples of doctors in action on the social determinants of health. They're very concerned about the health of Indigenous Australians, the gap between health of Australian Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. For men, it's 10 point six years for women, 9.4 years. When I got off the plane, a journalist said to me, we've spent billions of dollars trying to close the health gap and nothing's worked. What should we be doing? I said, I just arrived. <laughs> I'm jet lagged. Give me 24 hours, I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> 
Well, I was taken on this last visit to the shed. The shed is a shed, um, and it's set up to prevent Aboriginal male suicide in Western Sydney. These Aboriginal men um, involved in it, he was one of the clients. And the stories I was told were just awful. Children removed from families, the men cycle into despair, they're isolated, lost their families, they get depressed, and the suicide rate is five times higher than the average. And this centre is trying to deal with it. And you can see the effect on me of being told these one horrendous story after another. But there's good news. And I was taken to the, an Aboriginal community centre, the Tharawal Aboriginal Corporation, southwest of Sydney, and shown around by two Aboriginal women who were administrators at the centre. The belly cast program. Aboriginal women don't go to antenatal care. So they encourage them to come in to take plaster casts of their pregnant torsos and decorate them with Aboriginal art. Lovely, absolutely lovely. And the women love it. So they come in at educational gatherings, pregnancy and postnatal care at clinic or at home, care for women. So the women get involved and they get engaged and now they're hooked into this centre. And the children, when I was there the first time, I've been twice now, when I was there the first time, the little children were just being put down for their afternoon nap. And I said to the young woman looking after them, <coughs> how do you know if these children are developing normally? And she took a stack of forms off the shelf, one for each child, with 30 indicators of cognitive development, linguistic development, social, emotional, behavioral development. And she's got these indicators, one for each child. I said, where did you get these from? From the local university, up to the minute. The older children were involved in programs and then I went to the drug and alcohol part. And I said to the woman running this centre, you must have the most difficult job in this whole place. And she said, no, I have the most rewarding job in this whole place. And she took me over to the wall and showed me an Aboriginal painting. And she said, the man who did this when he came to us, he had all the problems of drugs and alcohol and domestic violence. And we helped him put his life back together. And he did this painting as a gift to say thank you. I have the most rewarding job, she said. And then the older people, grannies against removal. The default position of the childcare system is that Aboriginal parents are incompetent, take the children away from the families. And here, grannies against removal. And a psychologist in this centre gave me the answer to the journalist's question. We've spent billions, but nothing seems to have closed the health gap. And this psychologist said, if you spend 200 years systematically depriving a people of their dignity, disempowering them, taking away the ability of the people to control their own lives. It's hardly surprising that simple, simply spending money won't solve it. You do need to spend money, but people need to be empowered. I said I was invited by the ABC to do these lectures and they trailed my lectures by having me on a current affairs program. And the moderator asked me to say something about income. So I said, what do the following groups have in common? The 48 million people who make up the population of Tanzania, the 7 million people 
who make up the population of Paraguay, the 2 million people who make up the population of Latvia, and the 25 top-earning hedge fund managers in New York? And the answer is, the previous year, each of those groups had a combined income of around $25 billion. Imagine, I said, that the hedge fund managers gave up their money for one year. They wouldn't miss it. They're going to make a billion dollars each the next year. And you transferred that money to Tanzania. You could double the per capita income. And I'm not suggesting just giving it to individual Tanzanians, although that would not be a bad thing to do. But imagine the clean water you could pipe to villages, the clean cook stoves, the nurses, the teachers. And suppose the hedge fund managers said we couldn't care less about Tanzanians. Here's an even more fanciful thought experiment. Imagine they paid one third of their income in tax. I know. You and I pay a third of our income. They don't pay tax. But imagine they paid a third of their income tax. You could employ 90,000 New York school teachers. And somebody else on the program said, you're in fantasy land, mate. You're in complete fantasy land. Never going to happen. Fantasy land. And the next day was when I went to th the Tharawild Community Health Center. And one of the doctors held up a sign of greeting. <laughs> I say to you, colleagues, let me welcome you into my fantasy land and let's dream of a fairer world. I'm worried that the UN population projections for the poorest countries are really wildly off. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, let me answer a slightly different question. Um, we know things are going se serious because the um, life assurance industry in Britain, they believed our figures. They adjusted their calculations wow, we're not going to have to pay up for quite as long. This is great, but good for business. People are dying sooner. This is terrific. So they already took our figures seriously and adjusted accordingly. Now, we need to look, and in sub-Saharan Africa particularly, it varies enormously. A country like Zambia, life expectancy has been dropping. It's actually been getting worse. There are about 12 countries in sub-Saharan Africa where life expectancy is not been improving. On the other side, the good news is if you look at infant mortality in the African region, the gap between the African region and the rest has narrowed dramatically. So the between region inequalities has narrowed dramatically. It means that they will get older as populations, if, but it'll take a while take a while. Well, fertility has gone down um, in many countries, in South Asia particularly, as women get more educated and availability of family planning, the combination, fertility goes down. Could you? First of all, loved your talk. Thank you so much for coming so far to meet with us. And I'm wondering if you have calculated the impact on social determinants and inequality of Brexit. Okay. You can answer the question here because you're not at home. Yeah. Um, well, it's difficult to do. Um, it's difficult to do precisely. I mean, the government's own calculations is that we'll knock between 4% and 8% off gross domestic product over the medium term. Well, that's going to make everything harder. And if you make the population generally poorer, that'll make things harder. The second is, and I'm still hoping that it's not going to happen, but were we actually to leave and scrap various European directives that protect protect workers' rights, for example, 
that's going to make things worse for workers. So we're in this ridiculous situation that the leader of the Labour Party, who's supposed to represent the interests of workers, is pro-Brexit, which is going to make poorer people worse off and going to make workers worse off. In our National Health Service, they're worried about migrants and you're more likely to meet a foreign born person as a doctor or a nurse than you are as another patient. We've got vacancies in the NHS already because nurses have stopped coming from Europe and the doctors have stopped coming. I could go on. The European Medicines Agency is leaving Britain. Um, Euratom, we've got problems, you know, how are we going to get atomic materials? Um, our supplies of insulin, if we leave without a deal, diabetics are going to run out of insulin. Uh, on and on and on. Brexit will be a disaster, quite apart from what it's saying about the country we've become. We were a sensible, moderate, common sense place, a lot of tolerance tolerance for people of different ethnicities and national origins. And the whole Brexit thing has made that worse. Do I sound like I have a view? By golly, I have a view. <laughs> Evidence-based uh, mental health, uh, anxiety and depression. Uh, Australia built uh, computerized cognitive behavior therapy. A uh, London NHS built uh, computerized cognitive behavior therapy. Um, uh, the names of those are the, are Mood Gym, E Couch, and Beating the Blues. Um, these are basically unknown in a little uh, research university uh, uh, institute you've heard of called University of California. You can Google the five medical schools. Uh, there's a big telehealth department. Uh, what does it take to get an institution to point eyeballs towards something that's free? So Australia put it up for free. You, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not familiar. Well, I yeah. know about cognitive behavior therapy. I'm not familiar. Uh, Moogym.anu, yeah. Australian National University, .edu.au. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. so um, the last two deans of public health uh, ignored me for years, so I sued them. What do I do to get... Uh, at least academics to to look at uh, evidence based practice rather than oh the alternative is um, our our uh, providers who uh, don't believe in thermometers they they don't believe in, in measuring anxiety and depression so that they, they think they can read minds and so the the suicide the drug rate is I mean mental illness is clearly key to the whole social determinants of health agenda. Uh, and part of my argument is that people who are concerned with mental illness have to be concerned with social determinants of health. And people concerned with social determinants have to be concerned with mental illness. My own particular thing has not been about the treatment, so I don't have any particular informed view on your question, um, because that's not where I focused. But mental illness certainly features very strongly. Did you? Oh, you, you're holding the mic. Um, I'm here because I'm a member of the vulnerable population, as you were pointing out in the beginning. And, um, but I feel empowered now with the knowledge to know why. If only I can get my voice heard here. But I feel like what's missing um, from like your approach and your analysis to really dealing with the root causes of... Um, the inequities, gender inequity in our economic system and in particular healthcare system, is that it was designed by masculine cognition. So of course, we're as females, we're going to lose the race. And I'm here to represent. Um, I'm in a homeless shelter. Uh, I was put in a homeless shelter for women who've experienced DV and human trafficking. And um, when I tried to raise this issue. I literally was just issued, told I have five days to get out of the shelter because I tried to say that the policies that they have are discriminating against feminine cognition with the, my roommates in the shelter, and they actually understand that. And um, 
So, I mean, and I'm physically and mentally disabled and there's just a lack of care and compassion. I'm just wondering if there's anybody here who could help me get my voice heard. I mean, there's a, one of my roommates is a, a female. She was literally a day away from dying because she couldn't be heard in the healthcare system. So it's like, I feel, I feel like, is there anybody here? Who can I, Cause I, the thing is I, I have the knowledge to know why, but I, I don't know how to get my voice heard. And I'm just wondering if here you can help. Thank you. Okay. So Well, I'm full of sympathy, but I don't have an answer to the local problem. Thank you, His Lordship, for uh, entertaining my question. I'm all about titles. Uh, so in some of the slides that you provided, especially with the World Health Organization reports, could you project or maybe have some sort of idea of formally colonized countries, much like the Philippines and the United States, also the territory of Guam, which has a significantly lower um, life expectancy rate? What would you suggest or what would you hypothesize in the links of life expectancy as well as um, social mobility in those formerly colonized um, countries? Well, in our PAHO Commission report, for the first time, and I never thought this would happen, I'm going to be author of the report that talks about the impact on health of colonialism. And when it was first voiced by some indigenous members of our commission, and I said, you're talking about history, right? They said, no, no, we're talking about the present. And particularly thinking about First Nation Canadians, they said to me, I said, I understand. I understand everything. I've got a model that applies to everything. They said, you don't. Sorry, you don't understand. Um, unless you understand the relation of Indigenous people to the land, then your model is inadequate. It's not wrong. It's just not complete enough. And the relation of Indigenous people to the land has been interfered with by colonialism and it's still ongoing. So we don't have magic wands, but at least we are making it overt. We are talking about the impact of colonialism, particularly on the lives of indigenous people throughout the Americas. So we will, I hope, add some voice to these issues. One last question, and then we should stop because we're losing our audience. Um, I have a historical question that doesn't go quite as far back as colonialism, but I'm wondering about the concept of social determinants um, or social gradient in particular. Um, and I was just, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor of epi down at San Jose State, and one of the things that I was teaching recently was the Bradford Hill criteria. And I was just wondering whether um, social gradient was a deliberate kind of nod to the biological gradient. Um, and kind of how you um, and, and other social epidemiologists were able to kind of muster the evidence and the support for observing the social determinants and really getting that bought into. Well, um, recently I asked myself two questions. Uh, one was, where did I get the phrase social determinants of health from? Because I lay no claim to have originated it. I must have got it from somewhere. Somebody told me they'd seen it somewhere else, but I'm still trying to track that down. And the second question I asked was, where did I get the concept of the gradient from? I, I know where I got the concept from. I got it from the data in the Whitehall study. I called it a dose-response relation between where you are in the hierarchy. And Jeffrey Rose, who was my professor in London, said, nah, took it out, dose response. We're not talking about pharmacology. And he took it out. So I called it a social gradient. And as I looked, I have a sneaking suspicion I got it from him. <laughs> <laughs> I think he takes the responsibility, if not the blame. So I think that's where I got the term, the gradient, from, from Len uh, But the idea came from the data from the Whitehall study of seeing this, what I called at the time, dose response, but there you are, it's graded. And I was trying to make the difference between 
absolute poverty and inequality. And to compound matters, in my English review, I introduced, and this I take responsibility for, the ugly term proportionate universalism. And I was trying to get at the idea that, on the one hand, if you concentrate on poverty, which is the default position of Anglo-Saxon policy, US, British, whatever, you focus on the worst of. You miss the gradient. And then you've got a Scandinavian, a Nordic approach, which is universalist. But what about focusing on the worst off? So I, the classic British comp compromise, I called it proportionate universalism. The idea that what we want are universalist policies. I said a health system for the poor is a poor health system. An education system for the poor is a poor education system. So we want to bring everybody in. But we need effort proportionate to need. And the National Health Service does that. If I think the aim would be at age 95 uh, to die, bungee jumping and the rope snapped, and as you plummeted to your death, you wouldn't say, damn, I paid all those taxes for the health service and I didn't get my money's worth. You'd say, what a great way to go. You know, at 95, bungee drum jumping and the rope snapped. That would be great. Um, so if you didn't need it, they don't spend money on you. But if you've got diabetes and congestive cardiac failure and foot ulcers and the like, you need a lot of money spent on you and that's how it should be. So it's a universal system with effort proportionate to need. And given my focus on socioeconomic inequalities, let's have universalist programs with effort proportionate to need. And the gradient's crucial to that thinking. I, I love ending on a question about the history of thought because we are all standing on the shoulders of giants and we owe so much to so many here who came before us and I am looking forward to seeing so many future Michael Marmots running around the world continuing to battle these issues with, and which as Michael said are, are still so prevalent, so, so much with us. There is so much that we have to do so I hope that you all are inspired as I am by this wonderful talk. So one last round of applause and thank you. Tonight. <laughs>